great, great thing, so the problem was to get her side. Um, so this, this helped us keep the complexity under control. Um, and then the, the other thing that was really important that we did, which in order to show this, I'm going to have to start parallel up again. VMware, gosh. That was so good, so good on that. So good on that. What the heck?
feedback at part, and it was fairly analogous because the amount of memory it was trying to allocate had uh, gone larger than that in the wrapped around to negative. Um, because the, the algorithm I had implemented turned out to be big O of N factorial in a certain uh, pathological edge case. So don't do that. You know? Um, you know, basic, you know, if you're, you're working in a language which is not the fastest thing in the world, then it just becomes more important to know your basic stuff about algorithms and optimization um, and scalability. Um, and when all else fails, you know, if there is a module which optimizes in Python algorithmically, but it's still too slow, then you can always rewrite it as a module, which is what we ended up doing. Um, but, and so the vast majority of it is in Python, but there are C modules for two purposes. One is the performance critical parts that we couldn't get fast enough in the other way. The other part is operating system interoperability, because um, obviously, since it does things like launching applications and switching the active window and getting and setting text selections from applications, it is fairly closely involved in inter-application communication and low-level kind of operating system. So there are there are some cases where there just wasn't a Python library to handle something. Um, so we had to get into C to write it, um, which is where Swig comes in. Um, a full description of what Swig is and how it works is outside the scope of this talk, but it stands for Simple Wrapper or Interface Generator. Um, it was invented by my old CS professor at the University of Chicago, David Beasley. Um, and you, you write a .i file, which is input for Swing, and the most basic .i file is basically just a pointer to your .h file that defines the interface of your C module. Because Swing is basically smart enough to figure out uh, what it needs to do with that. And you only need to put other things in your .i file in the case where you're doing some really fancy stuff. But basically, you know, Swing can look at a C function which is taking an argument of a pointer at W R T and realize, oh well, it's Python equivalent to the Unicode string, so I'll make a Python wrapper for that function which accepts the Unicode string, and I'll do automatically all the conversion and the uh, memory management, which is necessary to make it work. So you run Swing on your .i file, it generates some code, it generates a Python wrapper, and it generates you some C that you can compile into a library. Uh, if you're developing on Windows, that means DLL, and then you just import your Python file, it imports the DLL and your functions link to it, and you can call your C function from Python, and it's awesome. But now we have a compilation step in our development process. Oh no! So, in a sense, it kind of lost the advantage of an interpretive language, um, but this loss is fairly isolated because, as I said, we only use C in the modules where we absolutely have to. Um, so, for most of the code, we're still able to quickly make changes and rerun it without having to compile any of that kind of stuff. Um, I really don't like make. I never understood its syntax. I never understood its dependency model. And I never understood why it's so sensitive to tabs versus spaces. Um, and we, we found this lovely program called Descons, uh, which is actually all Python based. And it will control your build process. And it is very smart. And it keeps with the Python philosophy that the simple thing should be simple. So down there at the bottom, program of hello.c, that is your basic make file for compiling the hello world.c. Um, you put it in a file called sconstruct, and you go in the command line and type scon, and it builds it for you. Um, it's cross-platform, and because scon itself is actually in Python, your sconstruct files are Python files, and you can use Python logic in them. So you're not limited to a strictly declarative make file type of thing. You can put debugging info, like breadcrumbs of what's going on if you need to debug a problem in your build process. Um, you can create custom tools. Like we created a wrapper for Swig, which was an s tool. And so we can then plug it in and say, you know, in our Swig file, do this, do that. Swig apply this file, file, file that. And it would figure out all the dependencies. So we wouldn't know exactly which steps it had to do. It was pretty smart. Um, next thing you gotta do if you're building your client by app is draw stuff on the screen. Um, WX Python was very helpful here for mocking up um, interfaces. Um, if you're doing any kind of a standard movie thing, um, you can even consider.
their feedback does we write type on user finished product. But for us, it was just a prototyping thing because the Enzo interface is very much not a standard GUI. Uh, the only thing you ever see on the screen is a transparent window that comes up um, that you can type letters into it from here. Um, it is transparent and green. And again, I would have shown it to you if I wasn't having this problem with VMware. Um, but because it's not a standard GUI, we couldn't simply go with WX widgets. Uh, making buttons and radio buttons and checkboxes for us. So we use time game as a more flexible way of uh, mocking up some interface prototypes. Because, um, you know, it, it's not just for games. If anything we're using throughout the screen, my game is very simple and very flexible and very prototyping. But when we went to the finished product, we used Hyro, um, which is a, a cross platform uh, 2D graphics library. Um, it does things sort of equivalent to what that quick draw does on the Mac, if you're familiar with that. Um, but it is cross-platform and it does have a Python wrapper called PyPyro. Um, and it's pretty advanced and very flexible. So pretty much anything that you would want to draw the screen, including for us, alpha transparency. Because our transparent window, you know, fades in and fades out. It does some fancy stuff. And Pyro works great for that. Um, Next thing you're going to need um, in your desktop application is uh, to communicate with the operating system. And as I mentioned, we do some pretty fancy stuff using uh, C extensions to get at uh, inter-process communication and low-level OS features. But in a lot of cases, you don't even have to do that yourself because somebody else has already done the work for you. Um, on Windows, um, a guy named Mark Hammond has written a very useful set of extensions. Um, that you can download from that link there. And then you can just do basically import win32com. Now you have access to the, uh, the com interfaces in Windows. And you can say, you know, com, get me the com interface for iTunes, and then get me the playlist from iTunes, and then, you know, list the tracks, and then uh, you can take the track and play it. So basically, any application that makes its functionality available through com pretty easily grab without having to write any custom C because it's all in this uh, Win32 extension. The Win32 extension also includes uh, Win32 API and Win32 GUI, so you can use this new cool stuff like query, what's the what's the frontmost window, what's the name of that window, what application does that belong to. Um, and you can you can do a lot of cool stuff with it. So if you're if you're on Windows, that's definitely something you should be checking out. Um, Again, now that we're going to cross platform, we are learning how to do the equivalent things on Mac and on Linux. Um, on Mac, the, uh, the Xcode uh, developer tools, actually a Python project, is one of the options you can choose from when you're creating a project. And the typical thing to do in the Mac world is create a Objective-C module. Um, and Xcode will basically handle for you the Python um, Objective-C bridge. And all of the Mac operating system API and all of its IPC stuff are all accessible easily from Objective-C. So that's what you can do on the Mac side. On the Linux side, I haven't dug into it yet. We've got um, some open source people on our mailing list who are writing us um, the uh, modules for our Linux backend, which is really great. Um, so I don't have to do it myself. But basically, similar mechanisms exist there. Um, and you can pretty much click into whatever IPC mechanism is available to Python. All right, so we've written our application. We've, we've debugged it as much as we can. We've got to release it. Um, Linux people might be you know, comfortable with the idea of downloading a source package and figuring out what the are for writing it, but we were releasing this on Windows. So we need something that is a very easy installer. Um, so there's a program called Python.exe, which, as the name implies, will take your Python program and bundle it up into a .exe file that somebody can run on Windows. What it actually does is um, it takes Python, in our case, Python24.dll. Um, in fact, with the Windows version of Python, when you type in a Python prompt, you're actually, you have a simple wrapper around Python 2.4 DLL, or Python 2.5 DLL, which actually contains the Python interpreter and all of the backend stuff. So what Py2EXE does 
is it uh, takes all of your Python modules and makes the .pyt and the compiled Python modules out of them. And it packages those up together with the interpreter, uh, which lets the Python 2 4 .dll. It turns it all into an exe. So when somebody downloads it, you know, it's like 13 megabytes for Hello World because it includes the entire Python interpreter along with your program. But it works. And it's, it's a lot better than the alternative. Um, and 13 megabytes isn't that much these days. People have access to that dimension, right? So we've got, it, we've got the .exe file. Um, next, we wanted to turn that into an installer, so we found something called NSIS. Um, and I forget what that stands for at the moment. Uh, but it's a project that will we'll take your .exe file and this sort of declarative um, file describing what all is going into this installer. It'll wrap it up as something that somebody can just download to their desktop and double click and does all the installation and the stupid it like I click on and agree to agree to this little uh, type of thing. Um, so the, if you want to distribute on Mac or on Linux, the nice thing is that Python already exists there, or it exists on most Linux distros, not all. Um, on the latest versions of Mac are shipping with Python 2.5. So, in principle, um, what, what we are doing with the open source version of Enso to distribute it on Mac and Linux is to simply um, link against the version of Python that we expect to already be installed on someone's computer. Um, once again, you know, the four long suffering Windows users uh, do not have this. Um, there is going to be a mini keynote tomorrow at 9 a.m. about, um, I think the title of the talk is Making. Uh, Desktop, Python in the desktop environment talk less. Um, this is given by my uh, colleague, Kate Radkin, who also worked on the Enso project. Um, so, his idea is you know, if we can just get um, a, a version of a standard version of Python that could be included with Windows, you know, that's probably not until now. But if we could, you know, Python could be a great standard distribution platform for client side applications. If you could just build against Python. Right, once run anywhere, wherever I heard that before. Um, but this, this does not exist yet. So for the moment, we're going with PyTEXT on Windows and linking against the installed versions of Python on that um, So I already plugged the uh, making desktop Python such that the other shameless plug I want to make is um, we're having an so birds of a feather at 5 p.m. today down in the Lagardia room in the basement. Um, like I said, it is an open source project now, so if you want to see, you know, the part of the presentation I couldn't show you today, or if you want to find out, you know, whether it's software you want to use or whether it's software you want to help hack on, or just ask any more questions about either getting involved with that or about building your own desktop stuff, um, then please come to our box. Um, and other than that, I'm, I'm open to any questions that you have. Yes? Hello? Okay, so I was wondering for uh, interfacing with your stuff that you wrote in C, uh -huh. why did you choose to use Linux instead of C types? Ah, um, we actually do use C types in some places. Um, basically, if, if something is either simple enough that there's not going to be a lot of logic involved in the wrapper, C types is a good choice, or if you're doing something weird enough that um, you want perfect control over exactly what's happening with all of those buffers, the C types is a good choice. Um, but in most cases, I found that Swig was a lot easier because it would deal with the buffer stuff for me. Like basically, you know, you're calling conventions for C, all that worrying about whether the buffer is allocated or not, or who's releasing it. Um, Swig so will take care of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, look at C types too. So it, it's always smart to see which alternative is going to be better for you. Okay.
you want to hold on for just a second, I think we're going to try to get the demo to work. Yeah. Okay. 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 Oh, I don't have the mic on. <laughs> so one of the goals of our open source development effort is to add more and more uh, commands to this to make it more and more useful and make the commands that you have work uh, in even more places than they already work. Um, and so we want to make it really, really, really easy for third parties to write their own commands and plug them in. And then the other thing that's kind of cool is uh, if you do a report bug command, then it takes you to this screen, which is the one I mentioned earlier that I really wanted to show when I talked about how we managed our uh, bugs, because this is where the uh, entire error log, stack trace, bug report thing comes in. And then I don't want it anymore. Whoa, no. <laughs> Say, and so close, close the window. So it does the window manipulation, the application launching and stuff. And also we've got plugins for it, so it'll do render hack. If you want to write some block text source code and just turn it into a nicely formatted image there, you can be like typing an email and have write an address selected, tell it to map, and it'll replace it with the, the image from Google Maps. Um, but again, different creating those require an internet connection. Um, so really, if you want to make it do everything and sort of liberate functionality from application silos, uh, but that's that's a long one. That's a whole other talk. So that's a whole talk about interface philosophy. Uh, but that's that's the basic introduction to how it works. So thanks a lot to wherever that guy went who helped me get around.